So, I mean, the way I started thinking about middlemen initially was this kind of very uh, simple definition as the, the person who connects buyers and sellers in a marketplace. Um, in my reporting, I actually came across um, a more expansive and uh, smarter definition. And this came from, from a, a VC here in the Valley named Mike Maples. And he says that a middleman in a network is, is, is that node in a network that connects other nodes to increase the value of the network. Okay, so that's looking at it from a more positive um, view, and it's, it's obviously a network view. And so it's really looking at the value of the person who is making those connections, because not all middlemen can create value, can, you know, can increase the value of the network, first of all, and secondly, even if they do, they don't necessarily um, help both parties enough to justify their cost. Mm -hmm. So I really like that uh, that positive angle, and, and and also it's so expansive that it goes beyond buyers and sellers. I mean, it has to do with like if I know somebody who I think you should meet, I can make that introduction, and I'm a middleman who's like right away increased the value of my network by making hopefully both people better off. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. Marina, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Thanks, Srini. Great to be here. Yeah, it is really my pleasure to have you here. You know, you and I connected because we are both members of the same Speakers Bureau. And when you told me a little bit about what you were up to and that you had written a book called The Middleman Economy, I was very intrigued because I had mixed feelings about the idea of middlemen. And I thought, you know what, if I have mixed feelings about this, this is something that I should definitely explore. But before we get there, um, as you know, I like to start with very strange questions to begin with. So uh, this actually, for some strange reason, came to me in the gym this morning, and I thought it would be a perfect way to start a conversation. Uh, when you were growing up, who was your hero and what impact did that person have on your life? And if you didn't have a hero, why not? Wow. I guess the, the first person who comes to mind is, is my dad. <laughs> I don't know, maybe if I thought a little bit more, I would come up with a different person. But I spent a lot of time with my dad growing up. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had mom and dad, but my dad uh, worked from home. He was a graphic designer. He's now retired and he still paints. But at the time, he worked from home essentially as a, as a freelance graphic designer, which is weird because I was growing up in the Soviet Union mm -hmm. where you really couldn't legally do that, you know, being self-employed and uh, finding your own clients and things like, you know, sort of under the table work. But the, the great benefit for me was having this, you know, smart, interesting person at home and um, I just, you know, I just loved that, that he was there for me and he cultivated a great curiosity in me. He was sort of like a natural born teacher. He was, you know, sometimes annoyed that there was this little kid under his feet, but um, he rarely, you know, made me feel that way. And he was very interested in, in teaching me and, and um, showing me how interesting the world is. And um, yeah, I just loved spending time with my dad. Mm. You know, it's interesting, uh, you know, when you mentioned that he was a graphic designer who was doing this in the Soviet Union, it took me back to a conversation I had with Mars Dorian about sort of what happens to self-expression when you are raised in a communist country. Um, yeah. And, I, you know, I, I told him, I said, I finally understood why his work uh, appealed to me so much, because it all screams with this blatant disregard for authority, everything about what he does. I am really curious about the impact that growing up in the Soviet Union and having a father who's a graphic designer has had on your, you know, sort of self-expression throughout your life. Yeah. And this is something my dad and I actually did talk a lot about, you know, about the, the role of the, the arts and the repressive regime. And he wasn't, you know, a radical um, artist and he didn't do a whole lot of painting. It was, it was commercial art that he, that he worked on things like, uh, you know, product packaging but um, 
you know, book illustration, things like that. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I just, I think um, more so than growing up in the Soviet Union, but just knowing that, gosh, you can do something that is, that is interesting to you and find a way to make it work financially, you know, because, you know, my mother, in contrast, was very practical, you know, she, she was the one who, when I was in college, was pushing me to become a doctor or a lawyer, you know, like your typical immigrant parent, mm -hmm. um, as, as you well know, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, but my dad was much more attuned, you know, to my interests. And, and by example, I guess he showed me that you can do both, you can do what your heart desires. And, you know, sometimes you have to make compromises to, to make a living, but that it was possible. Mm -hmm. So that idea that you could do something interesting and, and make it work financially, um, that's not a very sort of dominant narrative in our culture. In fact, I think the, the polar opposite of that is the narrative that we raise our kids with in, in school. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, the polar opposite of that is absolutely what I was taught. Like, interesting things make for great hobbies. They don't make for great careers. Uh, you know, not in those exact words, but you get what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm curious, you know, one, why you think that is, and, and two, you know, how do you start to change it? If you're talking to parents who many are listening, what would you say to them in that situation? Yeah, that would be, I think, a message more for immigrant parents, I think, yeah. <laughs> because I think that I actually disagree with you a little bit because the a very common message I do hear in our culture is follow your passion sure. and everything will work out. And that's become a bit of a cliche, too. So, mm -hmm. um, but for immigrant parents... Yeah, I understand the anxiety, you know, I understand the sacrifices that, that you made to um, leave everything behind and make a better life for your children. But I would also, you know, question what it means to have a good life. And one of the things that we have in America, <laughs> getting a little choked up talking about this, is this freedom to to pursue your own path, you know. And um, I think things, things will work out. I believe that there there are more important things than um, living a middle class life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So <clears throat> walk me through sort of, um, you know, growing up to what you've ended up doing today and, and how you sort of arrived at this sort of interest in all things uh, of the middleman economy, which I realized that could be a 20 minute answer, which is totally fine. <laughs> Yeah, um, it's it's odd. Uh, I write about this a little bit in in the acknowledgments of my book. You know, there there is actually a connection between growing up in the Soviet Union and thinking about middlemen. Um, you know, middlemen are are pro you know profiteers. That's that's sort of one way of looking at them. And profiteers were obviously reviled by by the Soviet state. They're people who are. Um, you know, defectors that they're they're breaking the system, but of course, you know, the system was already broken. Uh, I'm talking about the Soviet economy, and so the the middlemen, like the people who could procure Western goods or or whatever it was, um, they didn't do it by legal means, just because the laws were the way they were. Um, but they're the ones that kind of made things work at all, you know. And um, so I always saw that tension. Like on the one hand, people were um, contemptuous of, of middlemen, but on the other hand, they relied on them. And I think some of the contempt too comes from that reliance. Like you don't want a middleman who um, is a predator. And that's something I talk about um, a lot because I've had to think through how it is that we have these ambivalent feelings. And I think it does have to do partly with the fact that there are different types of middlemen, but partly because the more successful and powerful you become, the more opportunity you have for taking advantage of that position. For example, with you know, if you have a monopoly on, you know, if you've cornered the market, you can uh, decide what price uh, to charge, and that can seem exorbitant to, to the people who really count on you. So I've just been fascinated about that. You know, interestingly, back to my childhood, because my parents did talk to me about the Soviet economy, and I did see how they tapped into the black market. You know, when they needed too. So um, that goes that goes way back. Mm -hmm. But but in, more broadly, I mean, do you want to hear more broadly? Yeah, I, I do. Actually, I want to hear about sort of the journey from there to here. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, you know, I mentioned my dad, and uh -huh. it, it, one of the things about growing up in in the Soviet Union is there just wasn't a lot of stuff. There wasn't a lot of entertainment. You know, we had a black and white TV with probably like three channels. Um, it 
even books were, were actually hard to get a hold of. You know, like I remember when I was a kid, I heard about Pinocchio and I was fascinated. You know, this is probably me at six or seven. Um, and I wanted to to read that book and you couldn't get it at the bookstore. You couldn't get it at the library. And, you know, that, of course, arouses your curiosity even more. Um, but anyway, I guess my memory of, of growing up is this black and white world, you know, with shades of gray, where you kind of you kind of entertain yourself and you find whatever reading material there is. Um, there was, you know, there was chess. I was not a great chess player, but that's something my dad enjoyed. Um, there, there were books, there was conversation. And it was this kind of, I think it was conducive to a life of the mind, you know? I've just been fascinated by, I've always been a curious kid and always fascinated by ideas and wanted to talk about them, wanted to explore them. Um, and of course, at, you know, at the same time, there was this other side of me that was that was more practical and very anxious. Um, you know, when I was in college, I was I was just um, feeling terribly guilty about how much money my family was paying for me to attend this private university, which you know is not much by today's standards, but it was you know it was huge then. Um, and and so I did feel like the pressure to to get some kind of job that would at least you know at the very least uh, enable me to pay off um, student loans and things like that. So I went into technical writing in Silicon Valley, and this was fortunately during <clears throat> well it didn't start during the dot com boom, but very soon did <clears throat> bring us into that. And so you know I did pretty well financially, but I was also feeling like I'm dying a little bit inside. And so eventually, you know, after I had kids, I, I did start looking around and trying to do writing that interested me more. And um, that's how I slowly became a journalist and, and started exploring ideas in psychology and later economics and basically things having to do with human behavior I've, I've always found fascinating. And so that's what I do now. You know, I think the, the thing that struck me most about what you said is this, this sort of feeling of dying inside. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, part of me wonders if that's what it takes for us to make change in our lives. Uh, I, I, you know, I can't seem to find a story where drastic change isn't the byproduct of, like, being a, little, a low point or something serious happening in life that makes you question the path you're on. You know, Salim Ismail from Singularity University told me, he said, often it is a forcing function that gets us to make changes. Uh, at, you know, having studied, you know, psychology, human behavior, and economics, I mean, I'm just curious, what is your perspective on that? And is, is there a reason that it takes that kind of moment for people to actually want to change? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I think the simplest answer is that the, you know, the cost benefit uh, ratio has to has to work out. It, you know, for some people, it has to be um, so bad in the current state for you to take the risk of trying to do something different, right? Because whenever you do something different, it is scary, and you don't know how it's going to turn out. So often. You do have to wait until things are, are really, really bad for you to take that plunge. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. My case was a little different because um, I had this this opportunity. I was a, I was a stay at home mom. You know, my husband was supporting us, and um, so I had a little bit of um, you know I had a little bit of a cushion. I had this opportunity to to try something new. But yeah, I think a lot of it is about the that um, the cost of trying something new. You have to believe that the cost of sticking with what you've got is uh, is heavier, is higher. Well, let's do this. Uh, let's shift gears and uh, let's get into what I really want to spend most of our time talking about, which is this idea of middlemen. So I, I want to start by having you define what you mean by middlemen. And then I'd like to do an overview of each of the types that you went into, their roles, and look at examples of each, if that's possible. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, the way I started thinking about middlemen initially was this kind of very uh, simple definition as the, the person who connects buyers and sellers in a marketplace. Um, in my reporting, I actually came across um, a more expansive and uh, smarter 
definition. And this came from from a, a VC here in the Valley named Mike Maples. And he says that a middleman in a network is, is, is that node in a network that connects other nodes to increase the value of the network. Okay, so that's looking at it from a more positive um, view. And it's, it's obviously a network view. And so it's really looking at the value of the person who is making those connections, because not all middlemen can create value, can, you know, can increase the value of the network, first of all. And secondly, even if they do, they don't necessarily um, help both parties enough to justify their cost. Mm -hmm. So I really like that, uh, that positive angle. And, and and also it's so expansive that it goes beyond buyers and sellers. I mean, it has to do with like, if I know somebody who I think you should meet, I can make that introduction. And I'm a middleman who's like right away increased the value of my network by making hopefully both people better off. Mm -hmm. So I don't know about you, but vacuuming is not one of those things that I ever look forward to doing. But as you know, your environment has a huge impact on your creativity. So I still like it to be clean wherever I'm living and working. But now it doesn't have to be something that you deal with. If you're like me and you grew up in the 80s, you probably fantasized about the day when cleaning your house would be like it was for the Jetsons, meaning you don't have to lift a finger. Well, the good news is that we're already kind of living in that future. And the easiest way to make sure your floors are clean every day is with the iRobot Roomba Robot vacuum. It cleans up after itself. The clean base automatic dirt disposal takes convenience to a new level, automatically empties its own bin into an allergen lock bag that holds 60 days of debris and traps 99% of pollen, mold, and dust mites so you can forget about vacuuming for months at a time. Let the Roomba clean for you instead. It learns your home, finds dirt, and empties itself on its own. It's got powerful cleaning performance made effortless. Remember, if it's not from iRobot, it's not a Roomba. To learn more, go to iRobot.com slash unmistakable. So yeah, that's that's, and that's the most helpful definition of a middleman. Okay, okay. cool, yeah. cool. Um, uh, well, let's do this. I, I want to go over each of the types of middlemen because I know you, um, you know, you you basically separated the book into uh, different types of middlemen. So I'd love to talk about each one and kind of uh, one, you know, how do you define each one and then look at an example of each. Yeah, sure. Um, well, let's start with the bridge. I think that one is is really foundational um, because. It's, it's that person who we think of as a connector, you know, two worlds who are, that are not connected to each other it, were it not for the middleman. Uh, there, are, there are many examples. Um, the internet provides so many of these examples. And I would say, you know, let's just take Uber, you know, not everybody's favorite middleman, but you know, this is a company that, gosh, with, without, somebody like Uber playing the middleman role, you would have um, a much harder time, you know, getting a ride from a stranger, right? Uh, Airbnb plays the same role in, uh, you know, short-term rentals. Mm -hmm. So, th and these companies do much more and they do, uh, these middlemen play other middleman roles, but, but those are examples that I think everybody will be familiar with. Yeah. Yeah. Should we talk about the yeah, next? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I think a more um, interesting one that that is maybe a little less less obvious to people, and this gets into this gatekeeper idea. Mm -hmm. um, I call it the certifier. The certifier is the person that vouches for the quality of, of the goods that uh, he or she is selling. So uh, a middleman isn't just somebody who's just like pushing products like a salesperson. They're really staking their long-term reputation on the quality of those products. And that's where their, their power um, comes from and their value comes from, you know, if they're a certifier. Mm -hmm. So the, I think that the easiest example to understand here is a reputable seller on eBay. You know, eBay is this big open marketplace where anybody can buy and sell products. But a lot of the trade, about half of the trade flows through these trusted middlemen. You know, eBay calls them power sellers and they're different levels depending on how many, you know, what your transaction volume is. But basically, when you're buying from a power seller, someone who is like really highly rated and sells a lot of stuff in a particular um, niche, 
um, you can have a great confidence that you're getting exactly what is advertised and that, you know, that it's, it's worth what you're paying. So you're, you're paying for, for that trust, basically. It's like their seal of approval. Um, you're unlikely to get cheated because eBay has created this mechanism where you can review the, each transaction and reputable sellers certainly don't want to sully their reputation by, by cheating you in any way. And um, therefore, they are credible in their descriptions. You can trust them. And, and that's why they're, they're certifiers. Um, gatekeepers are another type of certifier. And this is what I think is, it would be particularly interesting to, to people in the arts because mm -hmm. there's, there's often this suspicion of, of the middleman, you know, the gatekeeping middleman, like, well, who are these people to tell me that, you know, that my book or my painting or, or whatever it is, um, is, isn't great. You know, I'm going to cut out the middleman. I'm going to go direct, yeah. but, you know, the, the gatekeeper can be your ally because their their job is to find the talent, the stuff that's going to do well in the marketplace. And granted, you know, there's a difference between uh, something that is commercial and something that is of uh, artistic quality and certainly things that are not um, commercial but are, are of high artistic quality sometimes never make it past the gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. But I think, if you know, if you've got something that the public really, really wants – there's a very good chance that a gatekeeper is going to help you get it out there because, you know, they're competing for um, quality, right? They're, they're competing with each other. It's not like there's this conspiracy of, uh, of gatekeepers. Um, and they only make money if, uh, if you sell, you know, that they only make money for saying yes. And they can only do that if they're willing to say no. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting to hear you talk about this because, um, you know, having just finished publishing a book and, you know, having basically made an ally out of a gatekeeper who happens to be my editor at Penguin, mm -hmm. uh, it really kind of changed my perspective on gatekeepers. Um, you know, it, it, it made me realize that, that what they did was hold me to a whole other standard that I wasn't capable of before I worked with them. Yeah. It, yeah, I think so. And I think that, you know, that can go anywhere along the line. In my case, it was it was my literary agent who held me to a higher standard, you know, uh, and that was great. And it really depends on the agent and it depends on the publisher, you know, they, they all vary in quality, of course. But yeah, that that is that is part of it, that they have these repeated, you know, they just basically have so much more experience in book publishing than you or I do, right? I mean, even someone who is a, a full-time author and who writes book after book, uh, they probably don't have as much experience as, as someone who edits or publishes, uh, you know, dozens of books every year, right? So mm -hmm. there's there's a real benefit there from working with that kind of middleman. So, you know, this is a question that came up as I was sort of reading the section on gatekeepers in the book, um, and it made me really think through, you know, how important this question was, because it's something that I kind of, you know, literally was, this was kind of what I felt if we didn't answer the question, uh, it would, you know, we would have missed one of the most important things to talk about here, and that is, you know, we have this sort of paradox in my mind that you have to resolve the value of gatekeepers, and then on the flip side of that, you've got this idea that Seth Godin has popularized of rejecting the tyranny of being picked or stop waiting to be picked or, you know, what James Altucher says is choose yourself. So I mean, from your perspective, how does that sort of a paradox get resolved or is there even a paradox there? Yeah, I mean, there are definitely people like Seth Godin who have been able to kind of go direct, right? Build a, build a following. And there's just so many people like that. Uh, what we don't hear about as often, obviously, are the many, many people who fail to do that, who tried to do that. They started a blog, they started a podcast or whatever it is, and it didn't go very far. Um, the, you know, they gave it some time and they never did find their tribe, if you will. And that story doesn't get told as often. So, so that's, that's the first thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes it is easier to just accelerate those connections by going through a middleman who already has those, you know, those inroads um, into the stores, uh, into the, um, the media and so on. Uh, so that's one thing. And then the other thing I would say is that even people who um, succeed, it seems, on their own do end up partnering with with gatekeepers, you know, they do often turn to traditional book publishing later, you know, because gosh, if you want to be a creator, um, 
often you just want to focus on the creation and you don't want to spend as much time on the marketing and the packaging and, and all the rest of that. Mm-hmm. So middlemen, you know, middlemen are there. Another example I use is um, YouTube sensations. Like these are people who just make these, you know, homemade videos and they, they find their audience and they speak directly to that audience. And it's, it's great. And they can even monetize that, you know, because there's this, well, I would say YouTube itself is is a kind of middleman as well because they can connect you to advertisers. Um, but beyond that, you know, there are all these people who are picking up these um, these uh, YouTube micro celebrities for endorsement contracts or book deals and and things like that. So um, you you kind of can't get away from the middlemen if you want to go into new worlds. Mm-hmm. Well, let's let's go into the other types of middlemen, um, and then we'll come back to this because there's still a lot of questions that I have around this. But I'd like to go over the other types of middlemen because I know there are several others as well. Yeah, sure, sure. So uh, the the enforcer, I, this is uh, <laughs> this is an interesting one. It's it's kind of similar in some ways to what I was saying about the certifier. It's about vouching for quality, but it's not vouching for the quality of a, of a good, of the inherent quality of a good, but it's rather um, keeping people accountable, um, so with services that they provide. Um, so, you know, an example that I uh, that I use in the book is uh, OpenTable, right, the restaurant booking site. Mm-hmm. Um, when you make a booking, um, you know, whether you do it through OpenTable or um, over the phone or whatever, there's always this opportunity to, to just kind of blow it off. You know, you make a restaurant reservation, but then you don't show up. You make multiple reservations with impunity. And OpenTable really tried to curb that problem because otherwise restaurants wouldn't want to sign up and wouldn't want to pay OpenTable if if they were opening themselves up to all these uh, possible no-shows. And so OpenTable, by being the middleman who oversees these transactions over time, is able to keep people honest. Um, They're... They're, they're basically keeping tabs on you. And, and that's what happens in, in so many other areas. Um, the, the modeling agent, you know, keeping models from, from flaking out on a shoot because it's very tempting in some cases to say, well, gosh, I, I don't have a relationship with this photographer or this uh, Fortune 500 company. You know, I've got some, something better that came up. But the modeling agent can make sure that you are not going to be that flaky because you've got a long-term relationship with the modeling agency on the line. So everything you do kind of counts toward that and can be a mark for or against you. Mm-hmm. So you're, you're seeing how that how that's working, right? How being yeah, in the yeah. middle puts you in this position. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so um, another one I, I think is, uh, is interesting is the risk bearer. Uh, I think book, book, book publishing is is a good example of that. And something I alluded to earlier about the experience that comes from doing multiple um, transactions, you know, multiple deals. You never know, you know. Aside, uh, given that yes, there's there's some there's some quality uncertainty and some accountability issues. Those are things that a middleman can control to a large extent. But there's always this element of random luck you know, what book, what album succeeds in the marketplace is um, largely fluky. You know, it's very hard to predict. And, uh, you know, even though, gosh, um, all other things being equal, someone who's already famous is going to do better on any subsequent project than someone who's not, there's still the question, well, how much better? You know, how much uh, do we pay this person for their for their name, right? Um, and so the middleman is someone who can... Uh, spread their bats basically by having so many um, irons in the fire, um, and and that's a valuable role because you know if you're if you're an artist and you want to go it alone, gosh, there's so many costs. Um, you may have great confidence in yourself, but no matter how great a job you do, you may still fail. And if you've um, borne all those costs yourself, you know all the marketing costs, all the costs of uh, packaging and editing your book and creating this great product, um, there's still a chance that, um, that you'll fail and, uh, and then you'll be on the hook for everything. And, and the way the culture industries have, have been um, structured um, is, a, is basically a risk sharing arrangement between the artist and the middleman, right? That's where the, the book advances come in, for example. 
So yeah, I guess this this actually raises a question kind of unrelated to middlemen specifically, but um, something I've been thinking about, you know, because people have asked me, you know, what is the difference between self-publishing and traditional? Because I've done both and I, you know, I was one of those sort of anomalies of self-publishing that was, you know, freakishly successful very unexpectedly. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we're in this very strange sort of middle ground that we haven't quite gotten out of where, you know, you could self-publish a book. You could do all the same things that a publisher does for you. You can basically get it bound the same way. You can design the cover the same way. And yet I think, you know, as far as the market is concerned, there's still this sort of perception of credibility that I feel a middleman adds that uh, is really interesting. And I'm curious what you have to say about that. Yeah, I I, I do think so. That this goes back to what I was saying about the certifier, you know, the mm-hmm. keeper. They're they're vouching for that quality, and and so, you know, people can believe that they're getting a better product. I think that's that may be less the case in book publishing, actually, because the the publishing brands. I mean, most people who are just ordinary readers. Yeah. Um, don't really know, um, you know, portfolio from Macmillan or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, you know, the, the buyers in the bookstores, you know, the the corporate buyers do know something about the meaning of those brands, and it'll be very hard to get your um, self published book stocked that way. Um, so, so there there's uh, there's that. Um, and was there another part to your question that I'm not addressing? Um, I, you know, I, I don't think so. This is more really a discussion. You know, like yeah, yeah. Uh, perception of credibility. I think is really the the sort yeah, of topic here. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But I think that that's changing because the more that we see, you know, high quality products coming out of uh, you know independent, uh, you know, in, in independent creators, uh, you know, the the less it makes um, a difference. I think, and that actually puts more pressure on the middlemen to then create value, right? Like, what what are you doing then? Yeah. So they're going to have to do more, I think, to to stay ahead. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that takes us, I guess, into there's two or three more middlemen types. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, I really love the, the, the concierge and the insulator, the last two types. So the concierge um, makes your life easier. You know, we're living in this information economy. You just need to Google something and, and it's there, you know. And, and my favorite example of what the concierge does in making life simpler is when you're planning a complex trip. There is just no end to the research you can do if you're planning a trip to a foreign country. But the problem is it takes time to process that information. And that is the part that that people forget. And, of course, we have tools like Google itself is a huge information processing tool. And you have things like TripAdvisor and Yelp and and so on. Um, but it can still be just really, really complicated to wade through all that information to make a good decision. And that's where the concierge can can really come in and help you. And they charge you, you know, like a travel agent now charges you, but it is so worth it when you when you do take that big trip because they can do it so much more quickly. This is an example of like accelerating connections in a network. You know, they've already, you know, they've booked so many people on similar trips. They've got connections with, with the hotels and and the tour companies and they anything that seems complicated to you, like figuring out, you know, what train tickets do I buy and so on, you know, they've got it all figured out. And they can do it much more quickly and cheaply than you can. So even after you pay them, you're you know, you're still much better off than if you were to do it yourself, unless you happen to just really enjoy that process. So that's just one example of the concierge, and it's an example of this like broader phenomenon of the internet not making um, middlemen disappear, but in in some ways making them more valuable. Yeah, yeah. And the the last one is the insulator, and and this is one that's probably the most like psychological, um, and it's this idea that you need someone who can take the heat. It can be really hard to advocate on your own behalf and a middleman such as an agent uh, can do that for you and they can do it so effectively not just because they have experience but because they have this psychological advantage when they're advocating on your behalf they're they're almost um, almost being an altruist you know whereas if you do it yourself it can seem kind of selfish mm-hmm. and, and that can create tension in, in a relationship so it's nice to have a third party do that for you and I call that the insulator yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you know, my, my business partner, Brian, insulates me from any conversations where we have to talk about a client with money. 
Yeah, exactly. He's the one who does all our sales, and that makes a huge difference for us. Exactly. Yeah, and and so in addition to, of course, the, to uh, to that psychological role, there's the fact that this this is a person who's just focused on that, and so he can get really good at it, and you can focus on what you're good at and what you most enjoy doing. So, you know, the question that raises for me, I mean, it kind of takes us back to, to gatekeepers again. Um, you know, as an individual creator, what is it that I need to be thinking about uh, when it comes to middlemen? Like, what is my role as an individual creator? And, you know, what is it tactically that I need to be able to apply uh, in dealing with middlemen? Like, how do I leverage middlemen as an individual creator? I guess is really the question. Yeah, I think you need to figure out what value you bring yeah. to the relationship, right? And I mean, I think that's true with any kind of relationship. Um, but there's this idea that, oh, gosh, if I just find like the right connection, then that person is going to, you know, make me rise up. And and that will only happen if you've got something great to, to bring to the table. So you really have to figure out, you know, what it is. If, if, you're, if you're seeking a really reputable middleman to sell your products, well, you've got to have products of high quality to sell. So you have to figure that out. But I think, you know, in the arts more than anywhere else, there's this huge element of subjectivity too. Um, and so I think it's important to remember that if you get turned down by one, that's, that's one person's opinion and you can just keep, keep pushing and find the right fit. You know, I think it's important to find the right fit with a middleman too. Yeah, I, I, I would say so. I mean, I always say that I'm really happy that it took as long as it did for me to get a book deal because I got the publisher that uh, I liked way more than any of the other ones that I had talked to over the years. Yeah, exactly. So um, I want to wrap with a few last questions, uh, some of which I've been known to ask. Uh, I'm curious, you know, about your own artistic influences. Uh, you know, what is uh, a book, a uh, piece of music or a movie or film that has profoundly influenced your life that has had an impact on your work? Oh, gosh, Srini, I wish you had warned me about this question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you can do one of each if you want. Yeah. And that's a toughie. You know, I'll, I'll just mention um, a Shakespeare play. <laughs> I, I studied Shakespeare in college, but this is a play that I actually first read in high school, um, The Merchant of Venice. Okay, and I'll, I guess a lot of people probably have read that in high school, and I've seen various productions of it, and I was just fascinated by this play. I mean, really fascinating on so many levels. Um, one, because of... Uh, the anti-Semitism and the relationship of sort of the outsider to the mainstream society, but um, also the economic ideas in, in that in that play um, in that text, right? I mean, there are these these um, there are multiple merchants, and it's it's not at all clear which one the title refers to. Um, on the one hand, it could be um, the guy who is like most literally a merchant who is. Uh, sending ships um, across the seas and who's risking great fortune that way in a very physical way. And then there is um, there is the, the money lender, Shylock, and he's the one who's reviled. And he's a merchant too because he's also risking uh, something whenever he lends money. And uh, it's, it's really interesting from this point of view of, uh, of middlemen to think about these two types and why is it that we sort of privilege, you know, we hold up one as an admirable middleman and the other as more um, suspicious and contemptible. Um, and, and that's something I've been thinking about for a long time. Well, this has been just uh, really, really interesting and different than a lot of our other conversations and, and <laughs> eye-opening because I think, you know, for a while, my sort of attitude towards middlemen was these are just all awful people who stand in the way of me and what I'm trying to accomplish until I finally <laughs> got, you know, face to face with one who has made a profound difference in my life. Yeah, exactly. I don't want to leave anybody with the impression that all middlemen are wonderful. You know, they vary in quality just like anybody else. But if you find someone who's a great partner that, you know, that can take you far. Mm -hmm. So I have one last question for you, which I know you've heard me ask since you've yeah. uh, heard our interviews. What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a really tough question to answer after, you know, hundreds of years. <laughs> because, yeah, how am I going to give an answer that is itself unmistakable? Um, I guess 
what what I've said to to my daughter um, at times when she's wanted to compare herself to others is uh, is is really true for adults too. You just have to be the best you that you can be, right? I mean, it's 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 it, something that probably sounds terribly hokey, but that's the best answer that I can give to that question. Awesome. Well, I I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, join us and share your story and uh, your insights with others. Where can people learn more about you? Uh, gosh, they, they could go to my website, marinakrakowski.com, or they can uh, look up The Middleman Economy. Cool. And for everybody listening, we will wrap the show with that. Next time on The Unmistakable Creative. Share a part of your truth in a safe environment uh, where you may not be judged and start to get comfortable with sharing parts of your story that perhaps you haven't shared before. And, and see that maybe you're doing it not for you, you're doing it to help other people, that your story is not about you. Your story has the impact and the potential to actually, you know, to, to, to move the needle for other people. Stop making the journey about you. Um, that's probably my biggest challenge or invitation to people in the context of their story. Philip McKernan returns to the show to talk about why giving unconditionally causes us to grow exponentially.